Our next talk will be by Jim R. Kelly in the Molecular Genetics of Cancer Division. She works with Andrea Strasser. She received her PhD from the University of Birmingham, and she's been in the Strasser lab since 2009. And she's exploring uh, one of the, mo the most exciting uh, new drug, new BH3 mimetic, uh, and will tell us some of her results on it. Okay, thank you to Jerry for the introduction and also thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to talk today and to tell you about some of the work we've been doing investigating a novel MCL1 inhibitor drug which we hope will be a treatment for patients that have MIC-driven lymphoma and possibly other cancers as well. So to start with an introduction to MIC-driven lymphomas, why are we interested in these? Well, it's estimated that up to about 70% of human cancers have deregulated expression of this protein MIC. And this includes some lymphomas and leukemias. A mix of transcription factor, and it's reported to be able to regulate about 15% of all the genes in the human genome. So it's hardly surprising that if you have deregulated expression of this protein, that the effects would be really quite far reaching. And it's involved in a number of different cellular processes. One of them is proliferation, and MYC is actually a really rapid inducer of cell proliferation. But it also, on the other hand, sensitizes cells to death, a process called apoptosis, under certain conditions of stress. So if you consider normal cells here, these two processes of dying and proliferation are really tightly coupled. Whereas in cells that are undergoing neoplastic transformation, it's really this high rate of MIC-driven proliferation which outweighs the cell death, and then you get uncontrolled growth of these cells and you get cancers. So a classic example of a MIC-driven tumor is a B-cell tumor, a blood cancer called Burkitt lymphoma. And Burkitt lymphoma cells have a genetic change. They have a reciprocal chromosomal translocation between the C-MIC and immunoglobulin loci. And this leads to deregulated expression of CMIC in the B cells. And then you get tumors growing out from this. And there's a high incidence endemic form of this disease that occurs in equatorial Africa. But there's also a sporadic form of the disease that occurs elsewhere in the world, but with a lower incidence. And because these Burkitt cells have very abnormal and high levels of MIC, um, Burkitt's is really a rapidly proliferating tumor, but it uh, requires really intensive chemotherapy. But also, the cells are kind of primed to die, so often this chemotherapy works very well. However, if it doesn't, which happens in about 15 to 20% of patients, or if patients just cannot tolerate the intensive chemotherapy that's required to treat them, then there's really very few other treatment options available for them. And so we feel that there is a need to develop new therapies, new cancer therapies that could be used for these patients and also hopefully um, be applicable for other patients that have MIC-driven tumors. So when I talk about a cancer therapy, um, what do we mean? In very simplistic terms, what we hope for is something that will be able to kill all of the malignant cells and leave the normal healthy cells relatively untouched so there won't be so many side effects. And actually, many current chemotherapeutics work by killing, ce uh, killing cells in a process called apoptosis. And we've been interested in our division in, in this whole process of apoptosis for a long time and understanding how normal cells turn over. And the idea um, is that is it possible to really kill cancer cells being able, by being able to manipulate different components of this cell death machinery? And that's one of the things that I'll talk about today. So the pathway of cell death that we're interested in is called apoptosis. And this is just illustrated here, but Kate this morning gave um, a, a much nicer introduction to this with her slides and her images. But what happens is when the cell receives a death stimulus, shown here, you get activation of this group of proteins, these BH3 onlys, and they combine to and inhibit these pro-survival BCL2-like proteins. And this leads to release of the execution of, of apoptosis back and back, and then you get this caspase cascade that Kate talked about, and the um, cell dies. And there's actually various members of these um, families, uh, various proteins within each of these groups. And what we believe, it's the relative expression of the one, the pro-death ones and the pro-survival ones, and the way that they interact with one another, which work really determines if a cell lives or if it dies. Um, so, we started investigating this pathway in the context of MIC-driven lymphomas. 
And given that we know that it's this group of proteins here which are responsible for keeping cells alive, the hypothesis was if we could maybe take one of these away that these cells were really dependent on, then maybe we could trigger this whole pathway and the um, cells would die, the cancer cells would die. And I won't go into a huge amount of detail on this, excuse me, um, and show you a lot of the data today, but just to summarize and say that what we actually found was that the MIC-driven lymphomas were exquisitely dependent on this particular protein, MCL1, and they required this for their sustained growth. And I'll just show you one slide to illustrate this. So what we've done here is we've taken this um, patient, human patient-derived Burkitt lymphoma cell line, and we've used a process called CRISPR-Cas9 to genetically inactivate the MCL1 gene. And along here, we have a number of clones of this cell line. And what you can see here, this is a Western blot, so this measures the, um, detects the MCL1 protein levels. And you can see in some of these clones, we've been really successful at inactivating MCL1. There's very little MCL1 protein here. And if we look now at the viability of these cells, turning your attention to here, what you'll see is those ones, clones in which we've inactivated MCL1, have started to die. So you look at this one in F2. They're no longer, very, uh, no longer viable and they've started to activate this cell death pathway. So this is good evidence to us that these lymphoma cells, these human lymphoma cells, are really dependent upon MCL1 for their sustained growth. And it implies to us that MCL1 would be a really good target for a cancer therapy. And there's actually a wealth of evidence now in the literature which is supportive of this. So we have our study here that shows it's essential for the sustained growth of MIC-driven lymphomas. Another study which was carried out by Stefan Glasser here at WEHI showed that MCL1 was really important for the sustained growth of uh, acute myeloid leukemia as well. And there's also been a large genome screen of somatic copy number alterations in over 3,000 human cancers across 26 different types now. And this showed that the genomic re region which um, encompasses MCL1 was amplified in about 11% of cancers. And actually, there's reports now when you go to conferences that this is much higher than this. This is more likely about 30%. So I think there's really strong evidence to suggest that MCL1 would be a really good cancer therapy. However, there are also a number of concerns about this. And this lies in the fact that it's not only these lymphoma cells which require MCL1. There's a lot of evidence in the literature that normal cells also require MCL1 for their survival. And obviously, when you hunt a cancer therapy, you want to really leave the healthy cells not damaged and, and viable. So it's been shown that MCL1 is very important in hematopoietic stem cells. It's important for a number of cells in the blood, B cells and T cells. And probably more concerning, I guess, is that it's been shown to be very important in heart cells and also in liver cells as well. So this really raises the question of would MCL1 be a safe target for anti-cancer drugs? And actually, for many years, this was really just a theoretical concern because we actually didn't have any drug that could target MCL1. There are drugs within the same family uh, that can target proteins within the same family, like BCL2, and you'll hear a lot about these this afternoon. But despite considerable effort, no one had been able to make one of these BH3 mimetic drugs, which was specific for MCL1. However, a few years ago, we were really fortunate in that a French pharmaceutical company, Servia, contacted us, and they said that they had one of these MCL1 inhibitor drugs, and asked, them, asked if we here at WEHI would test them in our preclinical models of um, cancer and disease. And so we've been working with them for a, a number of years, and I'm going to tell you about the work we've done in the MIC-driven lymphomas. You'll hear from Jia Nan after me about the work she's done in another tumor model as well. So this drug is called S63845. Um, for the chemists and structural biologists, this is the structure of it. And this is it bound into the hydrophobic groove of MCL1. And what's really interesting and really important for us is when you look at the binding affinity of this drug for MCL1, it binds really tightly to MCL1. But importantly, it doesn't really bind to the other proteins within the same family of MCL1, like BCL2 and BCLXL. So this implies that it is a really potent, but also a highly selective MCL1 inhibitor. So we went on to test it in our um, human Burkitt lymphoma patient-derived cell lines. And on this um, slide here, I've got three examples, three different cell lines shown here. And what we did was we took them in the lab and we treated these cells with increasing doses of this MCL1 inhibitor drug. 
And then we measured the viability of the cells, and that's plotted here. And these numbers here represent the amount of the drug which we need in order to kill about 50% of the cells in the culture. And you can see you don't need very much. So you need about 40 to 50 nanomolars to get really good killing. So this suggests to us that the human Burkitt lymphoma lines are really efficiently killed by the MCL1 inhibitor drug. So um, we went on and had a look at a number of other patient-derived Burkitt lymphoma cell lines, and these are different ones, seven of them shown along the bottom. And here I'm just plotting this IC50 value. And you can see that most of them, five from the seven, um, have IC50 values below 50 nanomolars, um, and there's a couple where it's a bit higher, more like 200 nanomolar. But overall, I think we would conclude from this um, that these, uh, this drug is really good at killing MYC-driven human lymphoma cells. Um, however, as I said to you a little bit earlier, there are concerns about whether a drug targeting MCL1 would be safe. And um, we can't really assess this in, in using human patient-derived cell lines. So we have to turn to a whole organism in order to do this. And we're really fortunate in that there is a very nice mouse model, the emumic transgenic mouse model of human Burkitt lymphoma, which was developed by Jerry Adams um, in 1985. And this mouse has a MYC transgene linked to the immunoglobulin heavy chain enhancer. So it essentially mimics the chromosomal translocation that you find naturally in human Burkitt lymphoma patients. And you get constitutive overexpression of MYC, again, in the B cells, and then eventually you lead to outgrowth of clonal pre-B or surface immunoglobulin positive B cell tumors. So we thought that this would be a good model in which to assess um, the efficacy and the toxicity. But one thing that was perhaps a limitation was that Servier had told us that their drug, the MCL1 inhibitor drug, had a weaker affinity for mouse MCL1 than human MCL1, about six-fold lower. So we weren't sure whether effective in mouse model. So the first thing that we did um, to do a very similar thing to what you do with human patient samples is to make cell lines, this time from the mouse lymphoma cells. And shown here are five independent cell lines. And again, we treated them with the MCL1 inhibitor drug in the lab, and then we measured the viability. And plotted here is the amount needed of the drug to kill 50% of the culture. And what you can see is now we've gone up from um, around 50 nanomolars, which we see for the human cells, up to about 200 nanomolar IC50s now. So it's very consistent with what they told us. It's not as efficient at inhibiting mouse MCL1. But we still thought it was pretty good. We could kill these cells. We just needed a bit more drug. So we proceeded to our in vivo model. And in this experiment, what we did was we took these cell lines that I just described to you, and we injected them into mice. And then we treated half the cohort of the mice with vehicle and half with this MCL1 inhibitor drug at a dose of 25 milligrams per kilogram for five consecutive days. And then we monitored the survival of the mice. And what we found is, if you look here now, the red line are the ones that were treated with the drug. And we saw a really impressive result. We found that in 70% of the mice, we could see tumor regression and the long-term survival of these animals. And so essentially, these mice really were being cured of their lymphoma. Uh, and we were really very excited about this. And when we had a look at some of the organs which we would expect it to be full of tumor cells, such as the spleen and the bone marrow, and what you can see is when you vehicle treat, you can see that there really are full of tumor cells three days after the treatment has finished. Whereas if you look at those that were treated with the MCL1 inhibitor drug, these cells, lymphoma cells, are no longer there. They've died, and it's just being replaced by normal cells now. So I think we're really very convinced that um, this drug is effective and would be a really good cancer therapy. However, so then we turned our attention to these potential toxicities and the effect on the normal cells. So the way that we did this was to, again, treat the mice with the drug for five days, and then three days later, we had a look at various different things. We looked at the peripheral blood cell counts, we looked at the weights of um, the organs, and then we looked really in depth at the cell counts and the compositions of cells um, from the lymphoid organs, and we also did some histology of the major organs. And, um, I'll quite go fairly quickly through these slides because the take-home message is there's very little damage to the normal healthy cells. So the first slide that I'm showing you now is when we looked at the peripheral blood counts. And what you'll see, it's the same format for all the other slides, is in black we have those that were treated with vehicle, and in red we have those that were treated with the MCL1 inhibitor drug. 
And you can see here, if you look at the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and the platelets, that there was really no change in these upon treatment with the drug. We then went on to have a look at the weights of the major organs. So we're looking at the spleen weights, lymph nodes, thymus, kidney, and liver. And yet again, we saw no significant changes upon treatment with the MCL1 inhibitor drug. We then proceeded to look in more detail now at these different um, cell subsets. And so we looked, the first one that we looked at were the hematopoietic stem cells, which we thought may be hit by this drug given the reports within the literature. But actually, we found that the LSKs, which were found in the bone marrow, weren't really affected by treatment of the drug. Similarly, we looked at various other subsets. So here I'm showing you the myeloid cells within the bone marrow and within the spleen. And you can see, again, no effect with MCL1 inhibitor treatment. And we also looked at thymocytes and mature T cells in the same conclusion. The only place where we did see a small difference was in the B cell lineage. So on this graph here, I'm showing you the various different B cell subsets within the bone marrow and within the spleen. And what you can see here is that there was a small but significant reduction in the surface immunoglobulin positive B cells within the bone marrow. But when we looked at the spleen, this actually wasn't significant anymore. So it was a, re a fairly small reduction. And then finally, we went to have a look at some of the solid organs, the liver, the kidney, the heart, and the muscle. And we did this by histology H&E sections, and this was assessed by Philippe Bouillet. And we saw no overt damage to these solid organs following this five-day treatment with the MC1 inhibitor drug. So this was all really good news. So at doses of this drug in which we could see really impressive tumor regression, we actually couldn't see any major damage to the healthy cells. So this suggested to us that there was a therapeutic window where we could treat patients and we could maybe get rid of their cancer cells and they would be able to tolerate this treatment. And we investigated this therapeutic window just a little bit further. So all of the um, studies we did at first was using a dose shown in green of 25 milligrams per kilogram for five consecutive days. And what you can see is that you can actually increase the amount of this drug up to the blue line, 40 milligrams per kilogram again for five days. And there's no real um, effect on the mice. The mice are quite happy. So in conclusion, um, we think that the sustained growth of mouse and human MIC-driven lymphoma cells requires MCL1 expression. And I've also shown you today that therapeutic targeting of MCL1 with a novel MCL1 inhibitor is highly effective for MIC-driven lymphomas. And also that the MCL1 inhibitor is well tolerated at therapeutic doses that can result in tumor regression. And we anticipate that this drug will enter clinical trials this year, and in the long term will benefit patients with MIC-driven lymphoma. So to acknowledge the people who are involved in the work, as with all the speakers, this is obviously not one person doing this work, it's a collaborative effort. Um, I work within the Molecular Genetics of Cancer Division, um, um, led by Andreas Strasser and Jerry Adams, and their great mentors. And I'd like to um, highlight all the people involved in the work, but particularly a very talented research assistant, Catherine Chang, who has worked at the bench with me on all of these studies. The collaboration with Servier has been led by Guillaume Lassane, and we've worked very closely with colleagues within the Cancer and Hematology Division and the Clinical Translation Center. And also to say that we get a lot of help from the support services here at WeHi, from Bioservices, Fax Lab, um, and histology, and to finally acknowledge the people who fund the work. Thank you. Uh, maybe while the audience is gathering their thoughts, you, could, you should perhaps comment on the uh, difference in, the nuts in seeing so much tolerability, but the papers like the cardiac paper showing a complete knockout leading into disaster. Yeah, and we were really um, very surprised by this. We, I think we expected much more damage to the healthy cells, and we, didn't, we just didn't see it, actually. And we think probably the difference is that when you have these previous mouse models where you genetically delete MCL1 and you completely take it away, that this is different from if you're just um, a kind of inactivating a protein for a period of time like you would with an inhibitor drug. And we believe that that's probably why... Um, why we're seeing a difference, that you can just take it away for a short period of time and the normal cells are okay, and then it can come back and recover. Any questions from the audience? Hmm? You did a great job. <laughs> Thanks, Jimmy.